The WNBA Finals begin today. Wimbledon is ditching line judges for the first time in its storied history, and we're looking at the state of the Patriots franchise amid some turbulent times for them. We're also checking in on the NHL, NFL, and global soccer. It's Thursday, October 10th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're speaking with Nesson's George Belecci on the state of the Patriots and how far they have fallen in the Boston sports fans' consciousness. Our reporter Colin Sallow gets us prepped for the WNBA Finals, and my colleague Alex Schiffer discusses Wimbledon's move to automated line calling and the state of robot judges in sports. First, let's hit some headlines. The NHL season has returned with some intriguing storylines to monitor throughout the season. The Utah Hockey Club picked up its first win in Salt Lake City under new owner Ryan Smith with a little help from a sold-out arena of 16,000 people. Meanwhile, in the Pacific Division, the Seattle Kraken lost 3-2 to the St. Louis Blues, but made their mark on history with the debut of assistant coach Jessica Campbell, who became the first woman to coach in the NHL. The Jets also had a coaching first on Wednesday, which was the first time Aaron Rodgers said that he had nothing to do with the firing of Robert Sala. On a Pat McAfee show appearance, Rodgers said, I resent any of those accusations because they are patently false. It's interesting the amount of power that people think that I have, which I don't. I love Robert. This comes after reports from The Athletic's Diana Rossini that Salah's termination came solely from owner Woody Johnson. Most franchises don't even need to address this chain of command stuff, but there are unique power dynamics at play here. From football to football, Red Bull hired former Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp as their new global head of soccer yesterday. Klopp, who was in charge of Liverpool for nine years, will now oversee Red Bull's international network of five teams and provide strategic vision, but will not be involved in day-to-day -day operations. Jim Trotter and the NFL have reached a settlement on the racial discrimination lawsuit against the league that started last year after he was let go by the NFL network. Trotter alleged that his contract was not renewed because he spoke out about a lack of diversity across the NFL, including on the media side. On Wednesday, Trotter released a statement on Twitter saying, the NFL and I have agreed to resolve my lawsuit. I will be creating a scholarship foundation for journalism students at HBCUs, and the NFL has agreed to make a donation in support thereof. Wimbledon is ditching line judges for the first time in its 147-year history starting next year. Instead, tournament organizers have decided to install automated line calling that will judge whether a ball was in or out within a tenth of a second. Wimbledon officials reportedly agonized over the decision as the tournament typically employs over 300 line judges during its run every year. I spoke with my colleague Alex Schiffer on the change and that conversation is next. Joined now by Front Office Sports Breaking News and Enterprise Reporter, Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. What's going on, Owen? How you doing? Doing great. So Wimbledon has had line judges for 146 years. That will change next summer when they move to fully automated calls. What prompted the switch here? Yeah, I think it's 147. I should have looked up who would have been president uh, around the time. I'm going to take a random guess and say, like, William Taft maybe was the first president when, uh, when Wimbledon got line judges. But uh, 147 ballpark in that um but yeah you know I, I think it's been a couple of things you know we've seen there's some marvel joke for me to make about hawkeye when they're not making movies of him but his name's been everywhere we've seen the nba adopt hawkeye technology um this past summer for this coming season and we've seen now every open in, every major in tennis except the french open go to the hawkeye artificial intelligence led system that you know is a lot more error free than than the human eye and uh, I think, you know, there's been a couple of things. Or you look at the Cincinnati Open where that uh, player got knocked out on a controversial call for match point. And then you even look, you know, Andy Murray at Wimbledon a year ago also lost on a call that would have been corrected had it been for Hawkeye technology. At the same time, he, fun enough, said that he prefers a line judges being out there. So he, I think he even kind of saw the, the conflict of, of emotions and which way would you like it. So I think there's been a couple of things linked to this, but just prevailing technology has kind of proven to be the uh, – the better system here. Yeah. Um, before we get to that, president when Wimbledon was founded, Rutherford B. Hayes. Taft was a bit later. I just wow. I didn't know that. I just looked it up. Well um, done. From Ohio, <laughs> Rutherford B. Hayes, I think. That's all I know about his presidency. Ooh. All right. Um, more than me, honestly. Uh, back to tennis. Uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like tennis seems to have the highest standards, frankly, when it comes to getting calls exactly right. I think they were the first to really bring in Hawkeye. And once they could, you know, go to the challenge system of, you know, this ball was a millimeter out. And it's something that a human, especially when that ball is going 100 miles an hour, can't be relied to pick up on. 
that just steadily brings the standard further and further. And so, yeah, when you have incidents like what you had in the Cincinnati Open, um, you know, it, it it's it's rough anytime you you lose a match on a bad call. Uh, but there were times when people would have just said, you know what, bad calls happen. You know that that stinks, but that's life. Um, that's not life anymore for tennis, and except for the French Open which I have to think is going to follow in everyone else's footsteps eventually. I, I feel like it just, you know, Murray's comments notwithstanding, just feels kind of sillier each year that we don't have, you know, the best calls that we can get. It's like peer pressure in college, right? There's that one kid on your floor who, like, doesn't want an underage drink and wants to be respectful to mom and dad. And then as uh, as time goes on, you just sort of work a, a bush light in their hands, right? So... It's funny, you know, you say how uh, how tennis is like the sport that is maybe the, the biggest example of it. And I'm thinking of like Armando Galarraga having his perfect game ruined and how that would have been fixed. Like I'm sure there's a bunch of people or teams or fans raising their hands right now and say, no, no, it's uh, it's our sport or it's, it's, uh, it's this game. I think tennis, you know, is maybe the most black and white or black and green sport out there, right? You know, there's a lot of colors on an NBA court. Football, the grass gets... Um, there's turf, uh, obviously, which which muddies it up. As is, um, you know, the different colors of uniforms and whatnot. I feel like tennis is the most like green and white. And to your point, like, or, or I guess clay is a little more more brown to it. But I think to your point, it's the most. Is it in or out? Uh, and if so, by how much sport there is, just from a uh, layout of the court. You know, everyone's looking down. So I think that there's some aesthetics that maybe factor into that too. Yeah, I mean, I think aesthetics actually becomes really important here because I mean the Galarraga perfect game is actually a really good example that was before MLB had replay and I think that was a moment when people started saying like okay this actually swings me over to that should have been overturned like it would have been better and the umpire even said like he felt terrible that he cost this guy's per perfect game on a bad call and um so I think there are those moments at the same time we are reaching a point of, of backlash in soccer where people kind of hate the VAR offsides thing. And it's, I, I think it does really cut into the viewing experience when it feels like every single goal, then they have to like scrutinize. Okay. When was this pass was launched? Was this guy's elbow ahead of this guy's thigh? And you know, if it is, then the goals overturned hockey, I think is, is not there, but I think there's more and more goals where it's like, okay, but now we have to go back to when they crossed the blue line. Um, was the puck an inch over before this, you know, edge of this guy's skate was an inch over. Um, I think there are some calls when people would just ha prefer to have it be, what does it look like in real time? We're okay with going with that versus a puck crossing the line. Did it cross the line or no? I think people want the exact call for things like, is this guy's body part over the line? I think that is that wiggle room where the aesthetics and the viewing and the experience of enjoying the game gets reduced when we we look at every single millimeter. Yeah, it's funny you say that. You know, uh, you like we were talking about Jim Joyce and Armando Galarraga, and I want to say for soccer, we're going down these rabbit holes now that I guess it's only sports writers can. I want to say for soccer and VAR, there was like a World Cup game, maybe it was around 2012 where England had a goal that hit off the crossbar and was in the net technically, and the goalie quickly cleared it away, and they couldn't review it. And that changed the match, and they got knocked out. And I remember, like, I feel like, to your point, there's there are games where we can very quickly point to and say, this is where the conversation around replay for it amplified or changed. And uh, and I think that, you know, we're starting to see this with the NBA, too, with, with what we've seen with soccer. You know, I think the NBA adopting uh, someone this year for to, uh, to specifically run the Hawkeye technology, be in charge of it, you know, I was told when I was reporting on that story that a lot of it just comes down to the side out of bounds and was it in or out, where did it go out, and like that being able to really kind of give you an approximation that fewer uh, options can, including the human eye. And I think that there is a line of walk, though, of, okay, how, you know, if it's game seven of the finals, like I totally agree, like look at every angle, find a way to make sure you get it right, you can't screw that up, but like uh, a 30-point blowout in the regular season or in tennis, maybe a random ATP stop where, you know, the score is overwhelming, like, you know, and, and with soccer, too, I mean, soccer isn't really a blowout sport, but like I do think there's a line of walk of how how far in the in the weeds are we going to get on some of this stuff and how much we're we just going to keep playing because the pace of, there is a correlation here with pace of play. And that's becoming a more a bigger thing, too, as we talk about baseball and whatnot. Right. And it, there are times when a, a human judge, I mean, obviously, you mostly just want them to get the calls right, but they can understand the moment in a way a, a robot would not. 
and with baseball, automated balls and strikes is the big one. Probably a challenge system is coming, not next year, maybe the year after that. And tennis went from challenge to just full on automation, as we're seeing here. Um, I think baseball is going down that path, but it's there is a real aesthetics issue that I think people are steadily moving from. We kind of like the umpire's quirks to actually we'd prefer just the calls be accurate. Yeah, I agree. And I definitely think, you know, maybe it's a generational thing. You know, you talk about the umpires like Lou Pinella getting his money's worth for getting tossed out was something I used to I remember learning about as a kid. And I don't think you see some of those, you know, I, I can't remember. The, remember the Atlanta Braves minor league manager who like threw the sandbag as like a uh, as like a grenade or whatever during his ejection. Like, you know, when you bring that stuff up, like that stuff really is more of the past and the future or the present even. And, and I think that that's definitely become part of this too, where it's just like it's become less about making your point and more about just like, all right, is it right or wrong? Let's move on. There's some societal impact of all that that we're probably missing, but we're not philosophers or uh, – or anything like that. So, uh, but to your point, I, I think the, the thing we're trying to get though is that these feel like little things, but they have a lot of tentacles to them that impact a lot of the viewing experience and what you think of the game. Yeah, and the sport. Absolutely. And yeah. so much, and so much of that is generational. Uh, we'll leave it there with your pinpoint analysis, Alex Schiffer. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Owen. Let's go Mets. Chicago Bears president and CEO Kevin Warren says that the team is studying private equity, but not currently looking that direction when it comes to a potential stake sale for the team. And that's completely fair. It's only been two months since the league approved private equity sales of up to 10% of NFL franchises. That said, there are leverage reasons why Warren would take that stance as well. The Bears are still trying to strike a deal to build a dome stadium in downtown Chicago that would make the venue a contender for the Super Bowl and college football playoff games. The Bears have pledged $2 billion toward the estimated $3.2 billion cost of that project, which would include developments around the stadium. That still leaves $1.2 billion to account for, and a 10% sale could cover something like half of that. But a stake sale means giving up a piece of the team, while public money is basically a handout. So the Bears don't want to, the former to eat into the latter. Given the team's stated commitment to this project and the governor's repeated skepticism around using taxpayer dollars on it, this remains one of the more interesting standoffs in the sports world right now. Staying with the NFL, in light of recent domestic violence charges against certain players, NFL officials have noted that player arrests have gone down by half since Ray Rice assaulted his fiancée a decade ago. The league saw at least 68 players arrested for each year from 2011 to 2014, but that number has typically been in the 30s or 40s since then. The same basic downward trend is visible in crime data for the United States as a whole, with some year-to-year -year fluctuations. The MLBPA is suing some sportsbooks over NIL and striking deals with another. The union reached a deal with Fanatic Sportsbook for non-exclusive rights to its players' name, image, and likeness. Fanatic's rivals in that space, FanDuel, DraftKings, Bet365, and Underdog Fantasy, are being sued by the MLBPA for using and profiting off players' names and images without paying the MLBPA for the right to do so. The deal supposedly creates a framework for those sportsbooks who would rather pay for NIL than legal fees. Over to the WNBA, Caitlin Clark's star power is transforming the WNBA, and that's allowing her team to think different when it comes to how they position themselves. The Fever's new president of basketball and business operations, Kelly Krauskopf, is looking beyond sports when she thinks about what the Fever brand can be. At her introductory press conference on Tuesday, Krauskopf said, quote, We have a foundational player in Caitlin Clark, and we're going to continue to add to that. But I want this team to be a leader in the country and an enduring brand like Apple. The peak impact a player can have for a team's brand is something like what Michael Jordan did for the Bulls or what LeBron did for Cleveland. But Jordan had Pippen and other big pieces, and LeBron needed to find other stars before he started winning. Step one of lifting the fever as a brand will be to find Clark some help on the court. Meanwhile, the WNBA Finals start tonight. For more on that and the league as a whole, I spoke to our reporter Colin Salow, and that conversation is next. Joined now by front office sports reporter, Colin Salo. Welcome, Colin. Thanks, Owen. Great to have you on, as always. So the WNBA finals are set between the New York Liberty and Minnesota Lynx. You've been writing about how these two are model franchises for the league. Make that case for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Liberty have yet to win a championship. They're not, you know, they're not perfect. The Liberty have yet to win a championship. The Lynx um, are kind of embroiled in some ownership disputes. But I think you're seeing two teams that made the finals that did it in kind of diametrically opposed ways in terms of roster building, but did it in ways that were, you know, 
I think, admirable when you look at the league. You look at the Liberty, for example. Again, they've never won a, a championship, but uh, when Joe Tai and Clara Wuchai bought the team in 2019, um, they really invested millions of dollars into an or- on this into this organization that was kind of rebuilding. Um, of course, they lucked into Sabrina Ionescu, but they built you know new facilities. They really invested in the team alongside the Nets and. It's clear that the rest of the league looked at them at them and said, "Hey, in a league that's honestly struggling in terms of the way it treats its players, why not go to the biggest market in the league with owners that are willing to invest in practice facilities and they had their whole charter flight dispute that got them fined, but the fact that they were willing to pay for it was kind of proof that they are willing to invest so they were able to get all these different players in free agency by attracting them to this investment. And here they are now with a chance to win their first finals. You shift gears to the Minnesota Lynx and you look at a team that just did it by winning, really. Um, they had they established a fan base in, in the league by winning a lot with the likes of Maya Moore and Lindsey Whalen in the uh, you know mid-2010s. And their fans never really went away. If you look at their attendance, they're always in the top three or four in the league, even when the team is just kind of middling. They're always a pretty consistent team, and they didn't need to like recruit major free agent names like John Quell Jones, but they still were able to build a competitive roster that's now, you know, kind of shocked the world. Also, I want to add that um, you know the Aces who won back to back championships, they they've kind of been embroiled in a scandal with uh, the Erica Hamby. Right and her her pregnancy and her complaining that she was discriminated. The leader of the Minnesota Lynx, Nafisa Collier, she took a maternity leave in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, and they let her do her they let her do her thing, and she came back, and now she's you know second in MVP voting. Um, early a uh, couple of years back, Maya Moore, you know, arguably the greatest player in in the WNBA, she left, uh, you know, to 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 help out um, with with um, with someone who was, you know, wrongfully convicted, and they let her retire, even though she was, you know, such a, a supreme athlete and, and and such an icon in in the team. So they've built this with, you know, I, I'd say good morals or, or things like that. And now you have two organizations that are meeting the finals, and um, it's very clear that they're they're two to follow in the WNBA. Yeah, for sure. And to that point of the Lynx just building this by winning, I, I'm stealing this from someone named Mike Patton on who I saw on Twitter. Since 1991, when the Twins World won the World Series, that's the last time any Minnesota team has been in the finals, except for the Lynx, who came into existence in 1999, have now been there seven times. So, yeah, a really um, impressive franchise there. Yeah. Um, and, and also what we're seeing, you know, this is, um, you know, just a moment for for some superstars to be in the the biggest spotlight for the league, you know, between the Visa Collier and uh, Brianna Stewart, Sabrina Ionesco. This is this is you know a time for the the non Caitlin Clark's of of the world to have their moment. Uh, and as long as we're on Caitlin, uh, obviously a huge year for ratings for the league. A lot of that focused on Caitlin Clark, but not all of that. And we saw that as a microcosm in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, we can't deny that Caitlin Clark is a huge part of the draw, right? Um, Her two playoff games got 1.8 million viewers and 2.5 million viewers. Um, Those were that I think the 2.5 was a cable record because it was on ESPN and 1.8 was the most in maybe like 22 years, if I'm not mistaken. So Caitlin Clark is the draw and the viewership has cut significantly since Caitlin um, was eliminated. Caitlin and the fever. I think it's down to about um, half it's close to a million per game. And for a WNBA that uh, league that did not even see a game past 900,000 viewers in last year's finals, you know, it's, it's a big win. It's still clearly there's an effect that Caitlin Clark brought, which is fans watch the game and there are going to be people who are going to stay for not just her. Um, to make the case that she's not the biggest deal is, 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 I think, just flat out wrong. It's very obvious that everyone wants to watch her. But at the same time, you can definitely see that there was a spike in growth for everyone else that kind of was the windfall of Caitlin Clark. Yeah, definitely. And maybe a bigger deal for the players than the fans, but these playoffs have also highlighted certain scheduling issues. What's the story there? 
the Lynx literally on Tuesday was when they won over the Sun to make the finals. And then there's a one day break, and then they're gonna play um, the they're gonna play in the finals already. And Brianna Stewart herself kind of commented that that's I, I believe her quote was like it's an insane um, scheduling issue. Um, but and then if you look at other leagues, there's always a long break before the finals to give teams kind of that um, chance to rest and recover. Um, but right now, as far as what we know, it's a lot of it is because of the broadcasting deals. Um, you can also look at the scheduling where they're airing games on Sundays and they're losing ratings because they're airing against the NFL. And there's not a lot of change that they can make in large part because the deal is only with ESPN. And ESPN only can put them in so many windows. So the idea that they're going to have maybe partnerships with their, in their new meteorites deal with the likes of NBC and Amazon could give them the opportunity to kind of not need to be cannibalized by the NFL in future years, which you know starts in 2026, and perhaps also change the schedule to give more of a break. There's also the effect of the Olympics of kind of why that happened. It's clear that the WNBA doesn't want to push its schedule to face the NBA when the NBA regular season starts. But again, with these meteorites deals and, of course, with the Olympics, uh, hopefully in future years, there's going to be a chance for uh, the, the, the WNBA to kind of fix its schedule, especially now that it's getting a big national spotlight. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where it's very easy for me to just like sit in, in my room and say like, well, this seems pretty fixable. But like it, one more day, I think, and we're not talking about this if they started on Friday instead of Thursday. I, I think that's probably enough for people to say, okay, that we can work with this. Um, so yeah, this seems very fixable and hopefully it will be fixed. Um, because again, it, it'll only take a day or two for this to be basically a non-issue, I think. Yeah. I mean, just to add to that, like I, I, I spoke to uh, ESPN president uh, uh, of content, Burke Magnus at, at ESPN media day a couple of months ago. And he, he was basically saying, you know, we think it's best if the WNBA isn't just with ESPN for the sake of its growth. And I think, you know, a lot of that is because of this scheduling issue where they can find more opportunities. Is it a lot of people think, oh, it's just because of us, the, the Olympics or dealing with the, uh, the NBA or the NFL. There's also just the fact that broadcasters have a limited amount of space um, on ESPN cannot air the games on Saturdays because they have college football. Uh, but maybe Amazon Prime could. So I think in 2026, you're going to see the schedule kind of play out a little bit better. But we'll see how the, how it also goes because the league is expanding I, I, I reportedly to 44 regular season games. So there's a lot to fix there. And um, you know, time will only tell how they go about it. Yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. Colin Salo, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Of course, always, Owen. Thank you. After nearly two decades of glory, New England Patriots fans have had to get used to a new sensation, irrelevance. The team is finding new lows with Captain Jabril Peppers now on the exempt list following assault and drug charges. I spoke to Nesson's George Balecci on the state of this franchise and how far they have slipped in the Boston sports world. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by reporter and host at Nesson, George Balecci. Welcome, George. Oh, and thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to talk Boston sports, especially right now with everything that's going on with them. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're excited because, yeah, interesting time, certainly. Uh, let's start with Drake May, number three pick in the most recent NFL draft, taking over as the Patriots starting quarterback. This is obviously a franchise with a certain history when it comes to quarterbacks. What are the hopes and expect expectations on him right now? Man, the hopes is obviously for him to be the next franchise quarterback. That's what any team would want when you take anyone top three, top five, top 10 overall at the quarterback position. That was a hope with Mac Jones, who is top 25. You want to get into that second contract. In my opinion, what every team should hope for is that it's a 10, 15 year timeline where you have the same guy under center and you end up giving him the bag and he pays for you in playoff wins and rings eventually. But I think the hope right now with the reality of what this team is constructed as, can he keep the hands on 10 and two on the wheel? Can he keep this offense on schedule? And can he make this offense a competitive offense? Because we've seen the last three weeks with Jacoby Brissett, a veteran starting, them total 3, 13, 
and 10 points. And he played his butt off. It's not all on Joe Kobe Brissett. And the issue with the Patriots is bigger than one position being the quarterback. Their offensive line, I'll tell you, is the worst in the NFL. Their receiving room is the worst in the NFL. And their play calling with Alex Van Pelt has been some of the worst I've seen because of the lack of creativity and the lack of just simply feel of the game and understanding what their strengths are. So from day one, when they drafted Drake May, I loved the pick, Owen. And I said, this is a kid that is a project. His feet are raw. His whole footwork is raw. His delivery, everything about him needs to be developmental and he's a project. But year two to two and a half, that's when they'll see the dividends paid. I just hate the construction around him with a bad offensive line, a bad receiving room, and a bad play caller. That is what could be a disaster for any rookie quarterback. I don't care how good they are because you look at the guys that have succeeded starting year one, a lot had to go right around them. So there is excitement of Drake May to take over under center. Patriots fans are just hoping to see them finish drives, get into field goal range, finish with 20 or more points. Like that is the baseline because they're yet to do that this season. I just don't think it'll happen in his first start because his Texans defense is really good. And the long-term picture for him this season is, does he not digress from the progress they've made of what he is now back to UNC Drake May? Injuries, I'm not afraid of that. He's It's football. It's a violent sport. He's going to get hit. I wasn't someone to say sit him because I don't want him injured. I want I wanted him to be sat until the structure around him was ready. It is not ready, in my opinion. It is just it, it's the worst for any rookie quarterback that was taken in this draft. Like Spencer Rattler will start for the Saints, like with Derek Carr out, and I'm excited because of Clint Kubiak and because of Olave and Rashid Shahid and a running game. I'm not excited to see Drake May start this week, next week, and the week after until I see some change happen around him. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks to just the broader state of the franchise. I think you could put Patrick Mahomes in there, and the results would only be so much better because and this is a franchise that used to be like you can almost pencil them into the Super Bowl on an annual basis. Now it's one that you don't have to think about. It's like, oh, we're, we're playing the Patriots this week. Like, all right, great. Like, this yeah. is it's not a bye week exactly, but it's uh, you know, it, often a cakewalk. Um, is this? I mean. Is this a franchise that has a direction? Does it have like hopes even for like next year, year beyond of like being relevant again? Well, I like that you bring up you could pencil them in for a Super Bowl because I completely agree. And look at the last time they won the Super Bowl. It was the 18-19 season. Since then, they've been to the playoffs once, and that has been since Tom Brady left in free agency. In that one playoff appearance, they got their teeth kicked in by the Bills on the road. Since then, it's been Cam Newton, Brian Hoyer. Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, Jacoby Brissett, and now Drake May starting at quarterback. That is six different starting quarterbacks. Since Josh McDaniels left, and including him, in the last four seasons, they've had four different play callers. They have whiffed on every first-round pick offensively that they've made as of recent. That is the exact opposite of what the Patriots were built up for. They needed a change. Bill Belichick couldn't last here anymore because his miscalculations as Bill Belichick, the GM, led to Bill Belichick, the head coach, getting fired. But right now, this season, all I was hoping for was six or seven wins and being competitive every week. They haven't been competitive the last three games. You, you can say they're competitive against the Dolphins. The Dolphins suck. And without Tua, they're terrible. And the Patriots were worse, like just to be blunt. So what we're hoping to see now, if you're watching from Boston, is get back to being a competent football team, to be competitive, to not have 12 penalties for 105 yards. Then next season, seven, eight wins, maybe hit, get a good left tackle, sign a big wide receiver and free agency. Then the season after that, get into the playoffs. That is what has to be the expectations. And that has to be on what the Patriots want as well. And we also need to hit on Jabril Pepper, Peppers. He's now yeah. on the exempt list. Um, future with the team and maybe in the NFL, kind of up in the air right now. Uh, obviously a very unfortunate situation, but how big a setback is this for the team to to lose their captain like this? Uh, it's huge. Um, what he brings defensively. I mean, you talk to him in that locker room. This is a guy that I've known about because me growing up in New Jersey, him being a few years younger than me. And he was the man in high school. He was the man in Michigan. He was with Cleveland. He was with New York, battled through injuries, but it's because he plays 125 miles per hour every snap. And with a defense that has lost Christian Barmore due to injury, has lost Joan Bentley due to injury, is now without Kyle Duggar. Jabril Peppers was a huge spot in the safety position and in the box. But you mentioned it. He's a captain as a leader. This is a team that gave him a three-year extension. And for him to do what he did, like I, I want to speak on the behalf of 
anyone that's been a victim of or affected by domestic violence, like I put my heart out to them and that's not easy to see them have that misstep is so out of character for Jabril Peppers for him to be found with cocaine in his wallet. Same thing is so out of character for him. So that is something that's felt through the locker room. That is something that's felt on the field. It is bigger than football in my opinion, because what he was doing affects other people. What he was doing could have affected his family as well. We've, know the amount of people that have lost their lives because of fentanyl being in cocaine. Like it it was such a massive mistake by him and he knows it. He called Gerard Mayo himself the next morning saying, this is what happened. It wasn't his agent doing it. He's taking accountability, but right now he's on the commissioner exempt list. He is not in the building. And this is a team that they have issues bigger than one individual, but it is a big loss. We will see. And I don't know what his future holds. And I was shocked. I was shocked to see this come out about Jabril Peppers And it's in the, I'm not going to act like I'm friends with him, but when you talk to him, media member to football player on record, off the record, he's just, he's an upstanding guy. He was, he made a huge mistake and he knows that this is going to be felt throughout the team on the field in the leadership when they need it very badly right now. I want to zoom out to not just the Patriots, but the Boston sports consciousness. So I think I have to assume that for a decade or more, the Patriots were, the thing in Boston and, you know, then the other three major teams behind that. Um, Given that the Patriots haven't been super relevant uh, in the NFL for the last five, six years, and whereas the Celtics are now NBA champions, the uh, Bruins had that, you know, record-breaking regular season that didn't go so well in the playoffs. Red Sox are getting back into contention. Um, Who who is, are the Celtics the number one team right now? Are the Patriots still somehow like in the middle just because, People can't get over them. Celtics are one. Cel- Celtics are so number one. I mean, they have two of the biggest stars in the NBA. They have a great core. They brought everyone back. They have the ownership group that will double, triple, quadruple down on being win now and bringing a ring to the city. On top of them putting together a top 10 historic NBA season and then just running through the playoffs. Injuries I don't care about. Those are NBA teams they matched up with and they made them look like division two basketball teams. The Celtics are totally number one. And what is happening with the Patriots right now is apathy, is people losing interest. There is the interest of what can this team do, but they're losing the interest of, I'll take you back to Sunday against the Dolphins, 70, sunny, Gillette Stadium, perfect football weather, and the stadium was 75, 80% full. People were leaving in the fourth quarter when it was still a one possession game and the Patriots had a shot of winning. And that's what the issue with the Pats are right now. With how bad they've been from 2020 to now, with the ownership just doing you know lip service to the fans, with what happened with Mac Jones, with running a iconic and the greatest head coach of all time out of town, but also was again his own undoings in his draft. The Patriots are falling. And what the issue is, it's going to keep happening because people won't want to give up that time on their Sunday. I just remember going back to training camp this year where we're looking at people attending and it was like, this is weird how low the attendance is at training camp. I mean, you could imagine getting up close to watch Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, all these guys I can name would be the biggest thing, especially in training camp, even compared to even going to a game, but that's not happening. And it is happening now where when you go out and put out an awful product of football, people will flip on red zone instead of losing their three hours of their day to the Patriots on Sundays. They don't have any primetime games. They had, well, they had Thursday night. It was because of the jets. They have London. And then after that, Oh, and it's no primetime games. Patriots fans, welcome to the life of a Carolina Panthers fan. That's what's happening now, and that is a huge issue. So it's definitely the Celtics are number one. I would still say the Patriots are number two, but they're about to lose their grip on that spot because as you pointed out, we saw the Boston Bruins invest in Elias Lindholm, invest in Zadorov, invest in Jeremy Swayman, put together a cup contending team. And we've seen the Red Sox hit the reset button and reinvigorate their minor league team and be on the cusp of getting into the wild card. They should take a step forward next season. This is a Patriots team that's two or three years away from the playoffs. And in Boston, that is death for you if you're not getting into the postseason because the standard is very high and the expectations from the fans will never sway away no matter how bad you've been as of lately. Right. And all of those teams have such a deep history to tap into. It's not like, you know, these these are like fresh, you know, 90s expansion teams or anything. Um, so, yeah, if the Red Sox can get back into the playoffs, if the Bruins can actually, you know, get to the cup finals, um, I have to think they're they're climbing the ladder, especially as the Patriots are still, you know, just trying to get off the floor. 
No, definitely. I mean, that's what's happening. This was a Bruins team that had a great defense last season, had the best goalie in the playoffs. And when that final buzzer sounded, when they lost to the Panthers in six games, the simple takeaway is they need to score more goals. And they invested in that. They're, they're another piece. They need more wing depth. They need more wing scoring. With the Boston Red Sox, it was they need to improve the lineup. They need to get better defensively. They need to invest in their pitching. And they did that in a coaching way. And we'll see Brian Bale can bounce back to be a solid, reliable number three and what they can do in free agency as well. With the Patriots, it was they need everything new. And I, I noticed I don't even note, mention the Celtics because like th that's not even a worry. That is not even a worry, on, especially what they did. But that's what exactly with that second apron yeah and even even when the new ownership comes we'll see you know they're getting a crown jewel like they have the superstars they have the fan base they have the tradition as you mentioned they have the high standard they have the head coach there are question marks in right now with the patriots there's question marks with ownership general management in the front office head coach quarterback and every single position on the team and that's the worst thing you can be they cannot point in any direction and go we have this figured out but the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Celtics, they can all say that. The Connecticut Sun, yes, they just got eliminated, but they were back in the playoffs and making it a tight series. Like all of these franchises can point and go, we're doing something right. The Patriots cannot. It's back to the 90s Patriots. That's what's insane. It's back to the 80s Patriots, which was before my time, but you hear about it and it makes sense of when they were the laughing stock in the area, they're getting back to that form right now and it's not good. For the rest of it, so it's okay, but because uh, you know we had to live through all those Brady years too. <laughs> but, um, anyway, George Vilecki, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Time now for Front Office Sports tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. If our last conversation had Boston sports fans pining for the glory days, Netflix has a show for you. The streamer is releasing a new docu-series on the 2004 Red Sox, who came from three games down against the Yankees to win the American League Championship Series before breaking the curse of the Bambino with their first World Series win since 1918. Yankees fans, you're allowed to skip this one. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love some feedback. Leave a review, look us up on social media, and say hi there, or drop us a note at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.